course number is 0010228, again it's four general hours. My name is Randall Gilbert and I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself because one thing that I like to know when I'm listening to a speaker is, is what's their background, why should I be listening to this person? Well, about me, in 2005 there was a, uh, they finally made a move to allow construction attorneys to become board certified. That was the first time that was ever offered. I'm one of about 160 attorneys that are board certified in the state of Florida in construction litigation. I was formerly a state certified master plumbing contractor. That's how I got into this field. <coughs> Most people who do construction will have some sort of affiliation or background in construction. My family's probably, I'm probably fourth generation contractor already by now. National Institute of Trial Advocacy Award, argued to the Supreme Court of Florida and multiple uh, appellate courts. and. Uh, I consider myself mostly a, a, a trial litigator. I'm in court just about every day. So what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to talk to you mostly about construction liens. We're also going to talk to you about con uh, terms and contracts that I want you to look out for, things that are going to help you, things that may hurt you. And then we're going to talk to you about a Chapter 558, which is called Notice of Claims. So those are the three topics that we're going to be covering. Starting with your review packet, <coughs> we turn to the first page, and I'd like to start off with just a little bit about uh, humor. This is supposed to be where the very first lean, this is the history of where lean started. And you got a picture of this uh, guy <laughs> in Italy saying, oh, I already put a lean on that property. And he's obviously shown the leaning power of Pisa. Well, uh, I refer to contractors as being super creditors, because if you do everything right, you guys are in a superior position than most creditors. What do I mean by that? I mean that assuming you all sued somebody, assuming it's a plaintiff versus a defendant and you get a judgment against them and you do not have a lien, the only thing that normally you can go after is what's in their bank accounts or whatever you can seize as far as being their assets, if they've got a truck, if they've got a car, if they've got, uh, like I said, bank accounts or, or some real estate which hopefully it's not homesteaded exemption. There's so many different exemptions that creditors can, contractors. If you're not a licensed contractor, you have no lien rights. In other <laughs> words, if you're doing construction work that requires a license, those are the types of people that have no lien rights. Other people who do not have lien rights. The statute's very convoluted, but here's the basics. If you're a subcontractor, you can have lien rights. If you're a sub subcontractor, you can have lien rights. Just don't go below the sub sub. Okay? Sub sub sub, you don't have lien rights. Yeah, I guess they had to draw the line somewhere. In addition, don't go below material lien. So in other words, if you're a material supplier to another material supplier, you have no lien rights. And here's another uh, exception which is, it's almost hidden, and that is, is that assuming that the general contractor enters into a contract with the owner, and that contract is for $2,500 or less, if you're a subcontractor to that, you have no lien rights. I've only seen that arise up once, and I raised it and somebody was completely surprised. So the next page is parties that are entitled to lien rights. Prime contractors, such as uh, general contractors. And when I'm talking about prime contractors, I'm also talking about anybody who's in direct contract with the owner. In other words, you don't have to be a general contractor to, to be in direct contract with an owner. You could be a plumber in direct contract with, with the owner and still be a, a prime. Anybody who's in direct privity, those contractors, excuse me, that are in direct privity, and again, who are licensed. Uh, Subcontractors and sub subcontractors, we spoke about that. Here's some other ones. Rental equipment suppliers, they're entitled to lien for the reasonable value for the period of actual use of their rental equipment. Nurserymen, but, uh, and, we, and we do have some people who are in nurseries uh, in here, but we're going to talk later on that it has to be planted items, not just simply maintenance. Professionals, such as architects, and uh, we talk a little, I'm going to talk a little bit about architects right here. And uh, even though we don't have any architects, but uh, for the purposes of, of the camera, if the property is not improved, then those architects 
have to be licensed in order to lean. There's actually an exception to architects. For instance, we have lots of people out there who are draftsmen who are not licensed. Well, they only have lien rights uh, if the property is improved and the property also has to be a, a single or, or a um, two-family residence. That's the only way they have lien rights. Also, the other types of professionals that have lien rights are engineers, interior designers, and surveyors. The next one is construction managers, but once again, a lot of people don't realize I've got, I've got owners who I represent, they hire construction managers. These construction managers are really just people who used to work for maybe a general contractor, but those people aren't independently licensed. If they're not independently licensed, they have no lien rights. Those people do need to be licensed. Lots of people don't realize that. But the 489, which governs the licensing laws for contractors, is very broad in describing what includes contracting. Material men and laborers as well. They also have lien rights. We're going to go to the next page, number three, where it says verify the property is subject to lien claims. What do I mean by this? In order to lien, you first want to know what type of property are you dealing with? Well, first we look at the, at the definition. Under 713.10, a lien shall extend to and only to the right, title, and interest of the person who contracts at the commencement of the improvement or is thereafter acquired. We're going to come back to this definition and we're going to apply it so that you understand what am I talking about. Let's, as far as owners, that owner, in order to lien the property, first of all, you want to make sure that the person who you're contracting with actually owns the property. In other words, you contract with me to improve this property right here that I'm standing in. I don't own this property. You're not going to have lien rights on this property. So going back to the definition, a lien shall extend to and only to the right title and interest of the person who contracts. If I don't have any interest in this property, you ain't getting lien rights. At the commencement of the improvement, okay, I don't have any lien rights right now. What happens if I purchase this property later? Then you get lien rights. Because it says, or is thereafter acquired. Let's go on. Joint tenants and tenants in common. There, there are different ways. I'm going to give you a little, little treatise here in, in ownerships of property. There are different ways that property can be held. You have fee simple ownership, which means that the person owns it outright. Or you have like here, joint tenants and tenants in common. Maybe you all know about this because maybe you share bank accounts with uh, a significant other. Well, joint tenants and tenants in common. Let's assume that me and my boyfriend, because this is becoming a recent trend in the law, have a, an interest, or me and my friend uh, have an interest in property. And you only contract with me, and not my, my boyfriend or my friend because I'm telling you, I'm seeing this. You only have an interest, you only have a lien against my interest in that property. Okay? So, you need to look at that deed, and you need to see who is it that's, uh, that, that owns this property. Well, let me give you a little help. In order to avoid this, this is what I try to do. Now, I put in the contract where the, on the signature line, owner or owner's authorized agent. Whoever is signing this is signing it on behalf of the owner or is the owner's authorized agent. And if that's if you're not going to be checking.